Well, we are very thankful to be here uh, together as God's people, singing, uh, listening to God's word. I want to say a special thanks for uh, both the last two times I've been out. In June, I was in, at, um, in Anaheim for the Southern Baptist Convention, and then uh, last week was in Miami for a mission trip, and Brother Mark preached uh, for me when I was out in June, and Pastor Ralph preached for me last week while I was out. And I just want to say again, I know I've said it many times, but I don't know that we realize how blessed we are as a church to have men like that. And by the way, if those two weren't available, we've got several others to choose from in our own church family that could stand in this pulpit and preach the word of God and always tell them, you're not filling in for me uh, because I'm not the deal. The deal is the word of God. You're preaching the word of God to our people. That is normally what I do, but you're going to step in and do that. And I know they both have done a tremendous job. I haven't had an opportunity to watch Ralph's sermon from last week. Because he is the youth pastor, all the other pastors, we evaluate his sermon. We adjust his pay accordingly. Uh, sometimes, you know, we have to drop it. Just to, all depends. It's what we do for the service we provide, but I know he did a phenomenal job. In fact, somebody told me between services that uh, we, we couldn't afford to give him the raise that he deserved from last week, so it must have been pretty good. Brother, thank you for standing and preaching God's word, but uh, we are going to be in, again in Revelation chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 11. Uh, I can't say enough about our mission trip to Miami, and not only that, but the, uh, the work that I see the Lord doing in our church over the last several months. Uh, when I came as your pastor, um, I, everyone wanted to know what's your vision for the church. And, and I had to be honest. I don't know. I don't know the church. I'm, I know some things that I believe the Lord wants us to do and some reasons that I believe the Lord has, has brought me here. But I can't give you a, a well laid out plan. And of course, any plans we had put together back then would have been shot because of what we went through over the last several years. But I knew I wanted us to be heavily involved in Atlanta, Miami, and New Orleans. Those three cities are all within a day's drive of Mobile, perhaps a long day's drive with no air conditioner, but still a day's drive of Mobile. And they are very influential cities in the southeastern United States. And as someone said on our way back yesterday, Miami is not going to become more like Mobile. Mobile is becoming more like Miami. So as we help those who are in Miami doing the hard work of reaching a very difficult, multicultural, post-Christian city, what we're doing is we're working in a laboratory that will help us learn how to reach future Mobile. And so we're working with them alongside of them in order to help learn what will even work here now. There are some many things that uh, they know that will help us. So anyway, we had a tremendous trip. I will share at length about it at some other time, but I just want to say thank you to the church family su for supporting that trip and the tremendous team that we had going on that trip. And I, as I said, I'll share much more about that later. Revelation chapter 19. As we read about Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 and following, we are reading about the Christian hope, the return of Jesus. We have one hope. That is that there is coming a day when Jesus Christ will return. Our hope is not here. And many times as Christians, we make the mistake of putting our hope here. We think, well, if I can just get a job or a better job or a promotion at my job, or if I can just get the right marriage or I can get my marriage right, or if I can reestablish my relationship with my adult kids, or if I can get my health where it needs to be, we think of our hope as being in those things. And we put our hope there. But all of those things will ultimately fail us. What will not fail us is that one day Jesus Christ will return. And so we're going to read today, Christians, about our hope. This is the hope that we have. Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God. 
to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for this passage that in some ways is so clear that you are returning. You are returning as king. And Lord, we pray that you would write on our hearts that message and that we would place our hope in that place. Lord, I also ask that you would help us with some of the imagery in this passage that's difficult to hear, it's difficult to read. Lord, I pray that you would help us see in it your glory and your victory. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. The return of Jesus. Jesus is coming again. Of that, there is no doubt. Jesus is returning again. Uh, we are as sure that Jesus is returning again as we are that Jesus came the first time, that he was crucified, that he was buried, that he was raised again, that he ascended into heaven. It was in Acts chapter 1 that the angels, after Jesus had ascended, said, "Why, men of Galilee, why do you stand here staring into heaven? This same Jesus who you saw will return in like manner. He's coming back just like he left. The heavens are going to open, and Jesus is going to return. And there are four aspects of the return of Jesus that I want us to notice in this passage. And the first aspect I want us to notice in this passage is the opening of heaven, the opening of heaven. So verse 11 says, then I saw heaven opened. Now up until this point in the book of Revelation, we have seen some things open in heaven. But this is a little different. So let me tell you what I mean. If we look back into chapter 4 verse 1, we see a door opened in heaven. In verse 11, chapter 11, verse 19, God's temple in heaven was opened. In chapter 15, verse 5, the sanctuary of the tent of witnesses, which is a reference to the Holy of Holies, was open in heaven. But we have not seen to this point in the book of Revelation that heaven is open. Now, there's one other time in Scripture that heaven is opened. It's in Ezekiel, uh, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 1. The heavens were open, and Ezekiel sees the vision. But this is different even than that. In Ezekiel, chapter 1, the heavens are open, and Ezekiel has a vision. He sees. The heavens are open for him to see. But this is different than any other time in Scripture and any other time in history. At this point, what happens is the curtain that, that separates the supernatural world from the natural world is pulled back. Heaven is opened and heaven invades earth. And it's not an invasion to take something that doesn't rightfully belong to heaven. It's an invasion to take back what does rightfully belong to heaven. So God created the heavens and the earth. All of it belongs to him. He gave us authority over the earth. And what did we do? We turned and we gave it to Satan. And since that time, earth has been under a different regime, if you will. But there's coming a day when heaven will open, and what we see here and what we don't see will become, uh, will come together. And we will finally see what has been described to us here in Revelation. So, right now, what we see in front of our eyes is the earth, the natural earth, what we see. And we are so many times tempted to believe that this is all there is. We're also tempted to believe that somehow this is more powerful than that. And it is only by faith in the revealed word of God that we understand in this time that 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 is there in heaven, that supernatural world, is more powerful than what we see in the natural world. But there's coming a time when faith will become sight. And in that moment, what will happen is the heavens will be rolled back like a scroll, as the hymn writer said, and we will see Jesus and the armies of heaven coming with him. So the first aspect is the opening of heaven. The second aspect of the return of Jesus is the king of heaven, the king of heaven. So we see this, this person riding on a white horse. Behold, a white horse and the one who is seated on it. Who is it? Well, we know it's Jesus. But I want you to look at the description of Jesus as given to us in Revelation chapter 19. First of all, he's riding a white horse. You might remember the other time that Jesus 
rode in as the Messiah. He rode in on a donkey. It's a sign of peace. It's of a general who's coming or a king who is coming in a time of peace. And of course, we know at that time, Jesus came in offering peace, extending peace, extending an amazing peace to anyone who would follow the Lord. So you think about the different characters that Jesus encountered throughout his ministry. You think about the lepers that Jesus encountered. And one of them was thankful, the others were not. What did Jesus extend to them? He extended to them peace and grace. He could have extended judgment. What a horrible thing to do, to be healed and not even thank the man who healed you. Jesus could have in that moment extended judgment, but he extended grace. Think about the woman he encountered by the well in Samaria. She had been married five times, and the man she was with was not her husband. She had a lot of religious questions. She was trying to deflect left and right. In many ways, she was mocking Jesus in their conversation. Jesus could have extended judgment in that moment. He is the judge, so he has the opportunity to extend judge the, the judgment. But at that moment, he's riding on the donkey, right? He's extending grace. He's offering peace. Think about Zacchaeus. Just this last week when we were in Miami, my kids had the opportunity to go to another church's youth group, and uh, the person who was teaching there told on Zacchaeus. And he and I were talking about this lesson before. And he said he was blown away to, because we think of Zacchaeus. What was Zacchaeus? Right, he was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. <laughs> so we think of Zacchaeus. Poor Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus so badly that he climbed up in a tree just so he could see Jesus. But we don't think about how evil and wicked Zacchaeus really was. He was an evil and wicked tax collector. So too was Matthew. Evil and wicked. Always deceiving. Always conniving. The more money they could get was the more money that, that went in their pocket. And they, had, they were authorized by the Roman government uh, to do just about anything to get that money. The Rome didn't care as long as they got the money. So they were really wicked, evil people, and they cheated people all the time. And so Jesus could have been in that moment the judge riding on the white horse. And instead, he says, Zacchaeus, come down from there, and we're going to your house. And I'm going to honor you with my presence. I am extending to you an offer of peace from God. So it is that Jesus rides into Jerusalem, extending to anyone who would accept it an offer of peace from God. But in this moment, he is not riding a donkey extending an offer of peace. And I want you to understand that from that time, from 2,000 years ago until now, this day, today, the offer of peace is still extended. But there is coming a day when the skies will open, the heavens will open, and the offer of peace will be no more. It will be at that time that those who have chosen to follow Jesus and to accept that offer of peace will be with him, and all others will be against the king of heaven. A white horse. His eyes are like a flame of fire. If you'll remember back from chapter 1, that was the same way that John described him when he saw him. And we talked about in that sermon how the eyes like a flame of fire, they burn away any excuse. So whatever excuse you might have for whatever you've done, you know, and, and here's the thing. You can satisfy most people with excuses. You can you know, have your story and you can explain why you did what you did. And you know what? Most people go, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess that must have been a difficult circumstance. I've never really been in that situation. And, and, and here's the biggest thing. You can actually satisfy yourself. You can come to the point where you go, well, that, you know, it was a difficult situation. But on that day, you cannot satisfy the judge with your excuses. All your excuses, all my excuses, they melt away. And you know, here's what I'm convinced of on that day. On that day, we will not open our mouths to offer any excuse to the Lord. I believe on that day, just one sight of the King of kings and Lord of lords with his eyes like flame of fire, and we dare not open our mouths to offer any excuse to him as to why we rebelled against him. His eyes are like a flame of fire. Riding on a white horse, he is coming, the king of heaven. Not only are his eyes like a flame of fire, but on his head are many diadems, crowns, crowns, but different crowns. All throughout Revelation, we hear about victor's crowns. They're stephanos. That's the Greek word. They're given in victory. You accomplish something and you win a competition and you're given a victor's crown. We're promised, by the way, Jesus has a victor's crown because he overcame. We're promised that if we'll hold fast in our faith, we'll be given a victor's crown. But Jesus here has a different kind of crown. This is the crown of royalty. This is the crown that, that is given to you because of who you are. 
Only twice in Revelation do we hear, other than this passage, about diadems. And both of those are fake crowns. They are crowns that are in chapter 12, verse 3, given to the dragon, which is Satan himself. He is crowned with seven diadems. Chapter 13, verse 1, the beast out of the sea, better known to us as the Antichrist. He is given ten diadems. They are fake crowns. Crowns. They have no real authority. They're authority that's been stolen. Jesus, uh, the book of John, tells us that Satan is the prince of the earth. He has an authority, but it's not his real authority. He's in open rebellion against God. He's leading an open rebellion against God. How did he get that authority? We gave it to him. God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. You, this is your authority. I'm extending my authority to you. You rule in my place. You rule in where I've given you to rule. We said, you know what, God, your way sounds good, but man, this talking snake over here, his way sounds a lot better, so we're going to go with him. So we handed that authority over to him, and ever since that time, he's been running an open rebellion against God Almighty. So when the skies part and Jesus descends, he is coming to take back with his many diadems those false authorities that have been set up and have been in place. Verse 13 says, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And whenever we think about Jesus in blood, we most often think about the blood of Jesus that he shed for us. And certainly, that's a beautiful thing to think about. But the robe that is dipped in blood here signifies not the blood of Jesus that was shed for us, but the blood of his enemies as he tramples the winepress of the fury of God Almighty, both here and then back in chapter 14, we're told that all the way back in the book of Isaiah, the Bible describes God is coming in a robe and he's trampling his enemies and the blood splatters onto his robe. This is a, a horrific reminder that God is coming, Jesus is coming as king and as ruler. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. Pastor, what is that name? I don't know. Only Jesus knows. Some have said, well, it's the Word of God because he goes on to say that his name is the Word of God. I don't believe it is. I think it is a name that only Jesus knows. Jesus is described by many different descriptors and names and titles in the book of Revelation alone. He's described by many different names. And so he has a name that is written that, uh, that is known by no one but himself. If you remember when, when Jacob, who would become Israel, was wrestling with the angel of the Lord, which is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. They're wrestling. And it comes to the point where he says, I want to know your name. Tell me your name. And he won't tell him his name. This is an idea of submission. Something like what we might say if, you know, you say uncle. Say uncle and I'll let you go. I don't know where that came up with. In, in my day, it's tap out. If you tap out, you know, you're wrestling with your brothers and it's, if you tap out, we're done. And so if you, uh, you either tap out or black out, that's the only way to get out, right? So you tap out. Well, in, in that day, giving up your name was a sign of submission. So Jesus says, you know many of my names, but there's a name that only I know. Why? Because no one has authority over me. I am submissive to no one. It reminds us that although God, in his great grace, has revealed to us so much about himself, what we know about God as he has revealed it to us, is nowhere near the full expanse of everything there is to know about God. There's a name of Jesus that we don't even know. Will we ever know it? I don't know. That's up to him. If he reveals it to us, we will know it. But there is something we do know about God, right? In fact, we know it about Jesus. Verse 11 tells us that Jesus is called faithful and true. It's not just that he can be faithful and that he can be honest. It's so much that his character is so faithful and so true that his name is faithful and true. We like to remember those good times, right? You know, I've said it, we've all said it. There was a time where a man's bond was his word, his word was his bond, and you could hand, you could, you could sell a house or, or for that matter, you could um, uh, sell thousands of acres of land with just a handshake. You remember those times? And, you know, remember hearing about those times? Man, a, a handshake was as good as a signed document. We think, man, those people were very trustworthy. And, you know, I'm not saying they weren't more, tr more trustworthy than us, but do you know why we now sign documents? We now sign documents because at one point somebody shook somebody else's hand and didn't follow through with the deal. <laughs> they said, next time I'll get it in writing. And then somebody put it in writing. But then some guy came along and said, that's not my signature. So he said, we need to get notaries. 
notaries that can verify these are our signatures. And now when you go to buy a house, you have to fill out paperwork that's about this thick. All Why? Because we are not always faithful and true. But Jesus, every time, faithful and true. So much so that it is his name. His name is also the Word of God. He is the embodiment of the Word of God. What we read on these pages here, what, we, what is unsearchable to us, is embodied in Jesus. I always encourage people that if you're struggling with how to live out something you read in Scripture, some concept or some command that God gives us, look at the life of Jesus. Because as you study something in Scripture and, and you read it in the written word, you see it embodied in the living word. Jesus was and is everything that God intended us to be in the way that he lives out the word of God. So he is called the word of God. And on his robe, the Bible says, and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We know what that means, that of all the rulers and the authorities and all the people in places of power, of all the bosses, he is over them all and he has authority over them all. But it's not just those people who oppress us, if you will, and you don't have to be a minority to be oppressed. You can just have a bad boss, right? Uh, you can experience oppression anywhere and everywhere. In fact, and some of us, to some degree or another, all experience oppression. And we like to look at the people who oppress us and say, man, when Jesus returns, they're in trouble because he is king of kings and lord of lords. But listen, he is also king and king, king of kings and lord of lords over the little kingdom that you, you and I set up in our own hearts. He's king of kings and he is lord of lords. And there's a day when he is calling us on our rebellion and he will have his rule and authority over us. Now, in the first service, I did not bring this issue up, but I'm going to bring it up here because I had a question between services. Somebody said, ask, does this mean Jesus has a tattoo? <laughs> so, this Bible verse, in verse 16, to read it again, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I want to say two things very quickly about that. First of all, no, it does not mean that Jesus has a tattoo. It could be that Jesus' name is literally written on his thigh. What I believe it refers to is that he, it is written on the clothing that he is wearing. I'm not going to go into detail as to why I believe that, but it could refer to either one. Some have said it is written right on his thigh, and I have heard many pastors say, and here Jesus comes, uh, not, not clean and riding on a donkey, but all tatted up and riding on a horse. I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration of what is said here in Revelation uh, chapter 19. Uh, however, this really has no bearing on the whole discussion of tattoos. That's a discussion for another time and another place. But I will say this to you. If you are under 18 and or you are living in your parents' house, living off your parents' dime, and they are footing the bill for you in any way, even if you're 28, 38, 48, 58, or 68, and they say don't get a tattoo, the Lord God in heaven says children obey your parents. So we will move on. That was a little mini-sermon for the Allen kids, in case you were just wondering. <laughs> All right. So, uh, the king of heaven, he has his name on his robe, written king of kings and lord of lords. That's who he is. What will he do? Verse 11 says, in righteousness he judges and makes war. He is not coming to offer himself for the sins of mankind. He is coming to judge and to make war. This is not a pacifist Jesus. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that God is simply disconnected from judgment, that somehow judgment comes on us because of our own actions and we get ourselves in our own messes and we basically bring our own judgment, the natural consequences of sin on ourselves and certainly that is true. There are consequences of sin that you put into motion that when you, you go down a path, it's just the way it is. But when Jesus returns, he is returning to make war. Do not let the 21st century that is uncomfortable with a, a God of judgment, do not let the 21st century take the God of war who is coming, Jesus Christ, and make him some type of weak God who will only return and say, oh, I'm sorry, I understand, it's actually my fault that you sinned. That is not the Jesus that is returning. The Jesus that is returning is returning right here. You read it, you see it, in God's word, he is returning and he judges and he makes war. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Jesus is coming and he is coming to strike down the nations. So powerful is this king that he will do it simply by speaking. 
you, you think that's really what it means? Yeah, I do. You remember when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden? And they said, are you Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth? And he said, I am. And what happened? They all fell back just at one statement. And there's no doubt, there's no doubt to me. If Jesus is powerful enough, and the Bible tells us he was the active a agent in creation, that yes, God the Father was involved, but it was Jesus who was the active agent in creation. There is no doubt to me that the God who can speak the universe into existence can speak victory and it come to pass. So, he is coming to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. That is a reference to Psalm chapter 2. that says he will dash them to pieces like pottery. Think of a clay pot and a rod of iron and the nations are dashed to pieces. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. We've had the opening of heaven, the king of heaven. The third aspect of the return of Jesus is this, the armies of heaven. Verse 14 describes them simply this way. The armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Who are the armies of heaven? Well, we need to be careful here. Because the Bible tells us many times, on many occasions, in fact, uh, Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 24, verse chapter 25, Mark chapter 8, Luke chapter 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Bible tells us that Jesus will return with his angels. The Bible also tells us all throughout the Old Testament that God is the Lord of hosts, which means he's the Lord of the armies of heaven. And the armies of heaven are what? They are angels. It's Jesus who said, I can call 10,000 angels here right now. I can call a legion of angels, and they will come, and they will fight for me. So we need to be careful here that we recognize that many times when the Bible speaks of the armies of heaven, in fact, most times, I'll say it this strongly, every time that I'm aware of in Scripture that the Bible speaks of the armies of heaven, it is speaking of angels with exception only here to Revelation chapter 19. Will there be angels in the army of heaven? I believe that yes, the angels will be included in the armies of heaven. Uh, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 through 42, the Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and will throw them into the fiery furnace in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Certainly that is the scene it seems we are reading about here in Revelation chapter 19. However, these angels, these armies, excuse me, these armies are described as being arrayed in white, in fine linen, white and pure. And there is only one group throughout the book of Revelation that is described as being clothed in white, and it is the saints of God Almighty. Not the angels, but those followers of Jesus, those who have placed their faith in him. In chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, in chapter 3, verse 18, in chapter 4, verse 4, in chapter 7, verse 9, in chapter 7, verse 13, the only time anyone in Revelation is mentioned as being clothed in white garments, it is the saints of God. I'll read to you from chapter 6 verses 9 through 11 that also records it. The Bible says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign God, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? Now stop right there and notice that what they're praying for here is what's coming to pass in Revelation chapter 19. So how long, Lord? And it's a prayer we pray, right? How long, God? How long will you let this go on? How bad can the world get? Lord, if, the, if there's a God in heaven, then why all, are all these things happening as they do? It's a prayer we pray. Well, they're praying the same prayer in heaven. They're saying, Lord, when are you going to make this right? Here's the answer. The answer comes in Revelation chapter 6. That very next verse, verse 11 says, Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were killed as they themselves had been. So they're given white robes. The same thing, uh, they are described in the same way in those chapters that I mentioned and verses that I mentioned just a moment ago. It's the only time anyone's described as wearing a white robe. Why? Because those white robes are the righteous deeds of the saints. So those righteous deeds that they are given 
they are clothed in those righteous deeds following Jesus. Jesus also promises the churches that they will rule the nation, nations with a rod of iron. So Jesus says to his followers, You'll, I'll clothe you in white. That's one of the promises he gives in chapter 3. And he also says, you'll rule with a rod of iron, the very same reference that is made here, Re Revelation chapter 2, verses 25 through 27. Hold fast what you have until I come, the one who conquers and keeps my works until the end. I will give him authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken into pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. So who wears white and is promised to rule with Jesus with a rod of iron. It is none other than the saints of God. You and I, those who have followed Jesus, those who have trusted in Jesus, what were these doing? They were following Jesus on white horses. You might think of this day, and you might think of following Jesus, and you might say, man, it'll be great to fight side by side with Jesus. I think that's what Peter thought. There they are in the garden. The, the, the troops come, the temple guard comes, and Peter's not afraid. He come, becomes very afraid in just a moment, but in this moment, he's not afraid. And he pulls his sword out. I mean, after all, Jesus just says, I am, and they all fall down. So Peter says, let's do this. He pulls his sword out, and I think in his mind, his picture is he and Jesus are about to fight side by side all the way to the throne of Jerusalem, and Jesus is going to take over as an army. And Jesus says, put your sword up. He heals Malchus, who Peter has cut his ear off, and he says, put your sword up. You know what? Jesus didn't need Peter's help. Had he determined to defeat the temple guards, he didn't need Peter's help. Guess what? In Revelation 19, when the heavens are open and Jesus rides in on a white horse, he doesn't need our help either. It's not like Jesus is going to get in a bind in some part of the battlefield and he's going to say, hey, Joe, could you help me out over here? No, they simply follow Jesus. They follow Jesus and they're clothed in white linen, which represents their righteous deeds. Here's what I want you to know. I want you just to reign so clearly in your heart. If you are not following Jesus on this day, you will not be following Jesus on that day. But praise God, he has given you this day, the day of peace. It is extended to you and I so that we follow him on this day and we can be following him on that day. You know, I hear sometimes as a pastor, people say something like this. Pastor, I, I know I'm saved. I'm just not following Jesus right now. Hey, that doesn't work. Try that at your job. I work here. I just don't actually show up. <laughs> Try that with your family. No, baby, we're still married. I'm not actually going to be there, but we're still married. It doesn't work. It won't work with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one whose eyes burn away all the excuses. It will not work. I'm saved, but I'm just not following Jesus. Those two things don't go together. Try to read your New Testament and find anybody who would say that. I'm saved. I'm just not really following Jesus. See, what happens in our culture is we place a big emphasis on decision, and decision is important. And we say, decide, decide, decide. Make the decision to trust Jesus. Make the decision to get saved. But that decision is not a one-and-done deal. If you make a decision that doesn't result in a life of following Jesus, then your decision wasn't a real decision. And so all of us are very susceptible to this because we've been given many opportunities in services like this and in things like Vacation Bible School and revivals. We've been given so many opportunities to make a decision. But if you look at your life, and your life before Jesus and your life after Jesus really aren't any different, then you did not meet Jesus. You cannot meet Jesus and be the same. Find somebody in Scripture who met Jesus to follow Jesus and their life was the same. You will not find it in the New Testament. And for that matter, you won't find it in the Old Testament. You cannot meet Jesus and follow him and be the same. So I want to encourage you to examine your life. Because if you're not following Jesus now, you will not be following him then. And it leads me to the fourth aspect of the return of Jesus. The opening of heaven, the king of heaven, the armies of heaven, and lastly, the enemies of heaven. The enemies of heaven. Who are they? Well, verse 19 says they're the beast, 
which again, we most often refer to him as the Antichrist. That word's not used in Revelation, but it's used in other places in the New Testament to describe this one who will lead a final act of rebellion. I say final because there have been many Antichrists and many acts of rebellion throughout human history. There are always Antichrists. There are always acts of rebellion. We're always able to rebel against God if we want to, but there's coming this one final kingdom that will set itself up in rebellion against Almighty God. God, and so the beast is the enemy of heaven, so is the false prophet. The false prophet works with the beast and helps deceive the nations. But I want to warn you, there's coming a false prophet, but my goodness, just read Scripture. There have always been false prophets. It would be so um, unwise of us to see that there's coming a false prophet at some point in the future, that there have always been false prophets in the past, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and to not know that there are false prophets here and now. There are false prophets here and now. And some of them, yes, are on your television sets. Some of them stand behind pulpits and preach. And some of them are just, just um, they're just the way that our culture thinks. And anything that goes against the word of God, anyone who teaches you a way to live that is other than the word of God, that's a false prophet and it's a false religion. And so on that day, the false prophet will stand as an enemy of God Almighty, as an enemy of the king of heaven. And then there are the kings of the earth, those in places of authority, who in order to hold on to their authority, in order to hold on to their power, they go along with the beast. They go along with the false prophet. They promote the beast. They promote the false prophet. Because to not promote the false prophet, to not promote the beast, is to lose their power. So they go along with it. And then there are their armies. They're described this way. Kings, captains, mighty men, horses and their riders, all men, free, slaves, small, and great. Anybody, anywhere, can follow Jesus, but anybody from anywhere can also follow the beast. You can be born on the other side of the world. And if you choose, in a, you can be born to poverty, you can be born surrounded by false religion. And if you choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you're just as much a part of his family as anybody born in the Bible Belt hearing the gospel from nine months before they were born. So also it is true that you can be born in the Bible Belt and you can have gospel songs sung to you from nine months before you're born. And you can hear the gospel from the day you're born until the day you die. And you can come to church every week. And you can sit in a service every week. And you can go to a life group. And you can be part of a serving. You can be part of the choir. You can be, you can be a deacon. You can do all those things. And again, if you keep people at enough distance, they can't really see the real you. And you can put up a persona. And you can be all the while deceived and be following the beast and the false prophets. You can be free, slave, small, great, kings, mighty men. doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. You can get caught up and deceived. So the enemies of heaven, that's who they are. What will happen to them? Well, the beast and the false prophet, they're thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur instantly. There's no battle. They gather they gather a great army, an army unlike the world has ever seen, but there's no battle. It is simply a victory celebration of Jesus. There's no fight. And they instantly meet this fate that they are thrown alive into the lake of fire. The rest, the rest will meet the same fate later. We read about that later in chapter 20, but for the moment, the Bible simply describes them as slain by the sword that comes from the mouth of the one who is sitting on the horse and then the birds were gorged on their flesh. That visual there is to describe a, a victory that is so overwhelming that the defeated enemy can't even get its own dead off the battlefield. They don't have the strength uh, or the numbers or anyone left to get the dead off the battlefield, so it is left to the birds of the air to do such a thing. The opening of heaven, the king of heaven, the armies of heaven, the enemies of heaven. Notice there's no third way. There are the armies of heaven and there are the enemies of heaven. Those are the only ways. You're either following Jesus or you are facing Jesus. And Jesus is a kind and amazing and beautiful Savior. He is a healer. He's a giver of life. He's a giver of grace. He's a protector and a provider. He is a defender. He is, the Bible says, one, a bruised breed he will not break. 
That means even if he comes to a blade of grass that's a little weak, that he, that he will heal it and not break it. That's what it's like to follow Jesus. But to face Jesus is to face a rider on a white horse whose robe is dipped in blood with a sword coming out of his mouth and eyes like flame of fire. There is a great difference between following Jesus and facing Jesus. And for this moment, God in his grace has extended a time in which you can be in open rebellion against God and not face the judgment and wrath of Jesus. But the day is coming when the skies will be rolled back as a scroll. Jesus will return and that offer of peace, that offer of forgiveness will be revoked. And the only thing that Jesus will bring is judgment. What we ought we to do with this? Well, follower of Christ, we ought to celebrate that this day written in God's word is as good as done. It's as good as settled. It's happening. It is not so much prophecy as it is pre-written history. It is just what will happen. God has said it. There's nothing else he has ever failed to accomplish from the beginning of time until this moment. All the prophecies, everything God has ever said that he will do, he will do it. Why would we think that he would fail to do what he has said he will do here in Revelation chapter 19? So we ought to celebrate because our, our redemption draws nigh. It is near. It is nearer today than it was yesterday. We do not know the day, but we do know that today we are one day closer than yesterday. For those who don't know the Lord, accept the offer of forgiveness that is extended now, the offer of peace. Accept Jesus as Savior so that you do not face him as judge. That offer is extended. And then for those of us who know the Lord, just one final step, a commitment, a commitment that we will do all that it takes to find those who are enemies of God and make them friends of God through the peace, offer of peace that God has extended through Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, help us, Lord, to know what it is you want us to do and who you want us to be. Lord, help us to follow you, not to face you. And Lord, help us to be committed to winning as many as we can to you. Lord, also help us to celebrate like a people who, who have hope and who have a promised restoration. Lord, that day is coming. And God, give us the faith to place our hope in you and only you and in your return. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Whatever need